God, please, please don't be mad at me. You know I can't take it when you read me the riot act. Give me a break, God, please. I'm dying here. I need you to hurry and answer me. Why do you take so long? Listen to me, God. I, I'm begging you. I'm in trouble, serious trouble. If I worry myself into a heart attack, could I give you credit for the great things you've done? My eyes are puffy from crying all night. God, I'm worn to a frazzle. All of the stress and worry over those out to get me. I can't take any more, God. I'm tired of eating grief three meals a day. Hey, you petty people who think you're so tough. Get lost. Newsflash. God has my back. He will answer me. I know it. Those who have it out for me, think again. May all your schemes come to nothing. May you know only the shame of your defeat. Well, I got to tell you, it's hard week in and week out to follow Bill, who does such a masterful job of bringing this scripture to life. I mean, this is Psalm 6. What we just saw and what we just heard was Scripture. And the thing is, I have a challenge for you, is how often do you feel the same way? How often do you feel like that you've eaten grief three meals a day? And it's just overwhelming. And you feel like giving up. You know, and I love the part in the, in the, in, in the Scripture there in Psalm 6 where the psalmist gets to the place and says, you know what, enough. You who scheme against me, may your schemes be revealed. And may you know that, that, number one, God's got my back. I mean, these are the, this is the truth of, of the psalm, but this is also the truth of Scripture. It's filled with reality. It's filled with reality. There's times in our life where we feel like things are going really great, and we're high and excited, and, and, and things are rolling along, and it looks pretty good. But then there's also times where things aren't so good. And I think that the, the re, for us this morning, the reality for me is I want us just to come into worship with this type of authenticity. To realize that there are times when we enter in where we don't feel so great. The week hasn't gone so well. But when we're brutally honest, we realize that the Psalms were filled with honesty they were filled with authenticity. They were filled with stories that, that go f deeper and further than even themselves were, were willing to go. And so we want to engage in this book. And we're starting our fourth week of this series, The Book of Life. We've been on this journey now um, looking at the Scripture from a different take. We're not preaching the narrative or the story that's woven throughout Scripture. Instead, we're looking at how can you apply the sections of Scripture to your life. How can you engage in God's word, apply it to your life, and not be afraid to turn to Scripture in order to receive the help that you need? So, again, going up here to our Bible timeline. So obviously, you know, for us, this is the whole Bible here, all these books laid out. Old Testament, New Testament, breaks right about here. And these are all the Old Testament books. But what we did was we broke them down into sections so you can see that Scripture is uh, it, it's pretty... Um, you know, formula-driven. We can actually see these different things. So we look at the first five books of the Bible, which is known as the what? Pentateuch. Very good. Awesome. So we had the Pentateuch, and then last week we looked at the history literature and uh, the history and our story as we found it. And then this week we're here to this point, um, which is uh, poetry and wisdom. So poetry and wisdom includes Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. So that's the, prof that's the, the poetic and wisdom literature. 
and the purpose is today, we're actually going to look at more of the poetry side of the Old Testament. You have to realize this morning that a large portion of the Old Testament is written in a style called Hebrew parallelism. Hebrew parallelism. It's actually known as Hebrew poetry. And the neat thing for us is recognizing when we see Hebrew poetry, it will actually look a little different. And the reason why I'm going to share this with you, and there's some, you know, Bible geeky stuff in here, uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm the quintessential Bible geeky guy. And, uh, and, and there's things in here that I, I want to actually show you because I want it to reveal something different. When you're engaging in God's word, when you have the understanding of what Hebrew parallelism is, when you understand what Hebrew poetry is, all of a sudden it becomes real. And there are a lot of congregations that won't preach this type of message. They just won't because they don't believe that the congregation can hang. They don't believe the congregation is smart enough to be able to pick up on these things. And, and there are, again, there are a lot of churches that just won't go there. We're going there because, one, I want you to experience the aha moments. I want you to engage in his word, and all of a sudden, as you're learning these new principles, as you're learning these things that maybe you've seen before but didn't have that word for it, then all of a sudden, you're starting to read scripture, and you go, oh, that's what this means. Or you see that there was an intention that the writer was writing for, and he wants you to engage in the writing for a reason. And so that's the goal. That's, that's our hope as we keep going forward. So there's a very easy way, and you're going to maybe even laugh at me, but there's a very easy way to tell the difference between um, uh, just the typical standard writing of the Old Testament and then when you see Hebrew poetry. And uh, typically when you look at Scripture, it looks like this. You see that there's verses, and they go margin to margin all the way across. Now, when you run across Hebrew poetry or Hebrew parallelism, as it's called, it's going to look like this. So, can you spot the Hebrew poetry here in the writing? It's the two lines right there in the middle. So, the, the top part of the section is giving us information, but then there's a break. That break is there on purpose. It's to indicate to you that something different is happening in the Scripture. Something unique is taking place. Either they're making reference, or they want you to see that there's something happening, and so you've got to pay attention to it. So here's an example for you. Turn to Job chapter 2. And if you're using the Pew Bibles, it's page 391. So page 391 in the Pew Bibles in front of you. And then we're going to look at Job chapter 2. Um, I apologize if there's not a Pew Bible in front of you. If you think about it, say a prayer to God of thanks, because that means that somebody in the service before you just took it because they didn't have one. And that's awesome. So don't get all mad if you don't have a pew Bible in front of you. Get excited, because that means somebody took one with them, and that's the exact point. We want people to engage in God's Word. And so if you don't have God's Word, take it with you, all right? We believe in this. Doesn't that give you goosebumps? That gives me goosebumps every time I say that, because it's so exciting. It is so exciting. So Job chapter 2, that's what I want you to look at. Look at chapters 1 and 2, and what do you notice about the style of writing? What do you notice? It goes all the way, margin to margin, right? It goes all the way, all the way across. Now, look at Job chapter 3. What do you notice about Job chapter 3? It's, in, it's shorter, it's indented, right? Okay, now turn the page. What do you notice? It's Hebrew poetry. What do you, okay, now turn the page again. What do you notice? It's poetry. Now, if you can guess it, if we kept going, what we're going to realize is that, is that the whole rest of Job is written in Hebrew parallelism. It's written in Hebrew poetry, which is exciting because, you know, 90, 97.98% of Job was written in Hebrew poetry. Did you know that 68% of all statistics are made up? Yeah. yeah. We're cranking them up, cranking them up. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> so, the scholars will look at the book of Job and recognize that the overwhelming majority, except for the first two chapters. Now, you have to remember, we only got chapters um, in about 200 B.C., so it was 
Um, it did not exist beforehand. There was no chapters, there was no verses. So the, the book of Job primarily was written in Hebrew poetry. Now that becomes significant. It becomes important for us because it's going to help continue to tell the story. Job, and I'm not sure if you know this or not, is actually the oldest book of the Bible. I know we tend to think that Genesis was written first because it's the first book, but that's actually not the way that it works. So Job was written first. And I know you might be asking, okay, pastor, what year was Job written? We actually don't know. We don't know the exact year. What we do know is that it was written before Abram was called to the covenant. Remember last week we talked about the covenant between Abram and God, and they walked the blood path in the desert, and we talked about how they chopped up all the animals, and there was a lot of blood, and and they walked through the blood path. Um, God walked it through twice in order to uphold his end of the covenant and Abram's end of the covenant, uh, which is going to be significant, remember. Uh, so we know that Abram was called in the year 2165 B.C. 2165 B.C. That's before Christ. So we know that the book of Job was written before 2165 B.C. Now, is anybody else just astounded by that? I mean, because now think about this. We're talking about thousands of of years. This letter has been around for us. Thousands of years. Now, ready? I'm going to blow your mind. Ready for this? It's never been changed. It's the original letter that we received over thousands of years. Now listen, if you can't get to the place where you understand that God is doing something unique and something miraculous by preserving these letters for us over thousands of years, I'm not going to get you there. I'm not going to get you there. You're going to have to take a leap of faith and understand that God has worked miraculously for thousands of years to preserve these letters. When you're reading this, you're reading a story that's thousands of years old. That's exciting to me. I mean, that's incredibly exciting because it shows God's intensity, not just desire. Hear me say that. There's difference here. God's just not showing his intensity um, or his desire. He's showing his intensity to preserve the words for us to be able to learn from the story of books like Job. Now, in Hebrew poetry, you're not going to see words or phrases that rhyme. You know, not like in English poetry. Often when we sing songs or we write poems in, the, in English poetry, we emphasize the rhyming words. So take this famous poem that was written by the Beatles. It's okay, you can snap along too if you want. And you can sing along as well. All right, now your turn. Very good. All right, we got some Beatle fans in the house. Cool. So if you notice, though, in the English poetry, it's the, the words at the end are the predominant words. That's the words that you focus on. Love, love me, do. You know that I love you. So there's a lot of, of the emphasis put on the end. Hebrew poetry is written a little bit differently. In fact, um, what you'll find um, when uh, Hebrew poets write, they don't put emphasis on the rhyming. Instead, they put emphasis on the flow, and they generally only work within two lines at a time. And now, so this, this, this again, just hang with me here. So the Hebrew writers would actually do three different things when they were writing. There's three intentions of a Hebrew writer. And here's intention number one. What they'll do is they'll take, the poet will repeat the idea in the first line. So they'll repeat the idea in the first line, and they'll repeat it in the second line. So they'll write what they were meant to write, and then they'll repeat it again in the second line in order to give emphasis. So here's the example. And I'm going to give you some of these, um, instead of you trying to kind of do the scripture kung fu and follow me around, I'm going to give them to you here. So Psalms 2 verse 4. But the one who rules in heaven laughs. So that's our line one. So there's information that's shared with us. And then now there's going to be a supporting line right after that in order to give power to what you just read. And that is the Lord scoffs at them. So you can see that there's a, there's a transition here. It's line one, line two. So that's Psalm 2-4. 
Now, the next thing that you'll see a poet do is the poet will develop the idea by adding more information from the original idea, which is in the first line, and they'll add more information to the second line. So you're going to see a statement made in the first line, and then you're going to see supporting information that will build upon itself in lines two and a couple after. So the example for us here is Psalm chapter one. Psalm chapter one is a very famous psalm. It says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. Okay, so there's our statement line. Now here's a supporting line. Or stand around with sinners or join in with the mockers. So you have the statement line at the top and then you have more information that's shared after that. Now you have to go to verse two and see that they did the same thing. Verse two gives us a line, but they delight in the law of the Lord. New information. Now, what's the information going to come after that? It's going to be supporting. The supporting information is that they meditate on it day and night. So, again, the reason why we're going through this is because I want you to have the aha moments. Not just to read scripture and to see these lines or lines and lines after lines, but that they're written with intention. They're written to show you that all the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. Now, that's good information. That's good information. You can take that and you can walk away with that. But look at the support for it behind it. Or stand around with sinners. Oh, that's even more powerful. And then look at the one right after that. Or join in with the mockers. So you see, it builds on on each other. All right, now the last one, the last style of writing, is that the writer will state the opposite of the first line in the second line. And they do this to build contrast and to make an emphasis on that what you just read is important. And we're going to tell you the opposite of it so that you realize how important it is. So we see that in Proverbs 15 too. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge appealing. That's good information. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge appealing. Now here comes the opposite line that's going to give more power to that first line. But the mouth of a fool belches out foolishness. But the mouth of a fool belches out foolishness. Now, doesn't that make sense? When you read with this understanding of Hebrew poetry and you read with the understanding of Hebrew parallelism, all of a sudden these these verses become more powerful. Yeah, I get it. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge appealing. Totally get that. But the mouth of a fool belches out foolishness. And you read that all together, that's just one verse. That's just one verse, Proverbs 15, 2. But that verse is communicating powerful, powerful information for us. And again, my hope is that we're engaging in this and it becomes aha moments. Like, wow, there's really a lot going on here. So, in order to understand the purpose in the writing of the book of Psalms, so we're going to jump over now to the book of Psalms. Psalms requires us to look at it really kind of differently as well. See, Psalms are words that we read in a book. But that's not how they actually they were originally used. Psalms actually were used individually and communally as songs of worship for people. So people use these psalms individually and they use them communally. And as you see on the screen, the word psalm literally translates to the word song. So this is these are songs, all the psalms. In fact, uh, what's what's really interesting is that the book of Psalms, which we get, which is a, it's the largest book in in the Bible, and it's very very large, is actually five different books. It's five smaller books that all end the same way, and they took these five smaller books and they just grafted them together and they called them the Psalms. But there was actually Psalms book one, Psalms book two, and you know so on and so on. So again, Psalms is, it, it's, it's a powerful book and it's a song. And the impressive thing about the book of Psalms is that people weren't just singing about, they were singing about their experiences about God, but it, it wasn't just all, you know, puppy dogs and, and rabbits and little bunnies hopping through fields and daisies. These people were writing out of raw emotion. And you have to remember that that these writers, when they wrote and when they sang these songs, they were writing what was in their heart. And again, we have to go back and realize, what's in your heart? When you come into worship, you're bringing your heart with you. And whatever's in your heart is what's going to come out of your mouth. So when you come into worship, you have to come in with a sense of authenticity. 
You have to come in with a sense of, of, of where you're at in your worship. And that's what we're going to see here through the book of Psalms, that there are times where they, they praise God through hymns of praise. And so they were, they were utilizing these hymns of praise in order to communicate this incredible message about God. But then they also used other hymns, like a hymns of lament, because they were hurt. There was pain. And they were, they were devastated. And I can tell you that as the, as the body of Christ, as the community of believers, as we gather together, sometimes the best thing that you can do in your worship, if you're being authentic, is to come in and is to sit down and just listen. And just take it in. Because sometimes what you need is healing. And you can't necessarily heal by, by singing something that you don't believe in or don't understand or don't agree with. And that's what the, that's what the psalms are. Sims, psalms are raw. They're, they are raw, they're honest, and they're gut-wrenching at times. Again, Psalm 6. Maybe many of you came in this morning and you feel like Psalm 6. And let me tell you this, it's okay. It's okay. This place has to be a safe place where you can live that out. And if somebody in this congregation doesn't allow you to live that out and tells you that you're wrong because of the way you feel, you come and tell me because I'll, 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 I'll take care of it. <laughs> because you have to be a safe. This has to be a safe place. So let's look at the first um, different types of, of psalms that we have. There's the hymn of praise, which I've mentioned. And hymns of praise, they glorify God for who he is. And uh, Psalm 103, perfect example. Now I'm going to go ahead and ask you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 103, and we're going to jump around a little bit. And if you're in the Pew Bible, that's going to be um, number 460. Psalm 103 reads, Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things that he has done for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. Now, that's good news. That's good news. I mean, that's good news for us this morning because it helps us to understand that this, this hymn, this song of praise is literally just praising God for who he is. It's just praising God for who he is and being able to, to give um, him praise. Now, if that psalm sounds familiar, it's actually a, a psalm that's used a lot in our modern uh, day worship. Songs like 10,000 Reasons that we sing in worship. The inspiration is Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Um, the song Healer, if you remember the song Healer, it says, you know, and heals all my diseases. Again, right here, Psalm 103, verse 4, uh, verse 3, sorry. And so, when, there's many, many times in worship when we gather together and we sing, we are singing direct references to Scripture. Direct references to Scripture. Sometimes even word for word. And we don't even realize it. We don't realize that, that most of the time when we sing, we are singing from Scripture. And I think that's another powerful reminder. As you engage in God's Word, all of a sudden as you sing, you're going to potentially see words on, you know, that you're singing or even just hearing the praise and, and the prayer around you and realize, wait, that's here in the Bible. I remember reading that. And then it becomes even more supportive. It becomes even more supportive to your faith and your growth in Christ. So now we go to the harder part of the book of Psalms, and those are the songs of lament. Now, the psalms of lament, like I've already mentioned, were raw. They were honest, and it's because the Israelites were a very honest people. They cried out to God, and they would ask God, why? Why have you caused these things to happen? Why are you doing this to me? God, what are you doing? How come we're, we're experiencing this suffering? What are we going through? Why are we going through it? And they were raw and honest. Let me ask you this. When was the last time that you were honest and vulnerable before God? When was the last time that you were truly honest and bare before a holy God? And, and really cried out to God and said, God, I don't understand why this is happening. Why are you doing this? Because 
I want us to realize this morning, our God is big enough to take your prayers. Our God is big enough to be able to handle your lament, you know, and, and you have to be honest and you have to be real and raw. Now, there is a fine line between, between being honest and real with God and being disrespectful. And there is a line and you have to be careful. But man, when was the last time that you praised God in your brokenness? I mean, church, did you hear me this morning? When was the last time that you praised God even in the midst of your brokenness? Because this is what a lament is. It's, it's brokenness spilled out before us. So here's the example. Let's keep moving. Psalm 74. That's page 446 in the Pew Bible. Psalm 74. He says, Oh God, why have you rejected us so long? Why is your anger so intense against the sheep of your own pasture? Remember that we are the people you chose long ago, the tribe you redeemed as your own special possession. I mean, folks, there's anguish there. There's anguish. There's desire there. I mean, they're saying, listen, why have you done this, God? Why have you left us? And then there's a reminder. Don't do it to us again. You know, don't forget us. We're your chosen people. I mean, God, do we have to remind you to stop punishing us? Because remember, you said that you were going to take care of us. You said that you were going to provide for us. And these are our hymns of lament. The purpose of a lament is to communicate that raw emotion, both good and bad. So the third style is the song of thanksgiving. Now, these are easy to spot. These are easy to spot. One reason is because they use words like because. A lot of times when we read a psalm and we see the word because, it's there because they're going to show you or tell you why they believe what they believe. So in order to see that, this is where the singer worships God for something that God has done. Now this is different from the hymn of praise because remember, a hymn of praise, we're worshiping God just because of who he is. But a song of thanksgiving, we're worshiping God because God has done something specific and we want to thank him for it. So that's what a psalm of thanksgiving is. The example, Psalm 116, page 467 in the Pew Bible. Psalm 116, great hymn of thanksgiving. It says, I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy because he bends down to listen I will pray as long as I have breath. Death wrapped its ropes around me. The terror of the grave overtook me. I saw only trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Please, Lord, save me. How kind the Lord is. How good he is. So merciful, this God of ours. The Lord protects those of childlike faith. I was facing death and he saved me. I don't know that you get more thankful than that. I don't know if you get more thankful than that. You know, one of the things that we say often around here is that you worship and praise God more when you realize what he saved you from. Isn't it easy for us to thank God and to, and to really live in these hymns of thanksgiving and these songs of thanksgiving because we recognize where he saved us from and what he saved us from. And that's exactly what's happening here. I love this line. I love the Lord because. Why? Has anybody ever challenged you with that? You say, man, I really love God. Why? Why do you love God? Well, because He's really cool. I mean, is that going to pass the test? Why do you love God? And, and hear me say this this morning. If you don't love God, why don't you love God? Because I think God wants both emotions. I think God wants both interactions with you to be able to, to, be able to engage in a dialogue and a conversation. And don't tell me that it's just one way because God will speak to you through his word. You open up his word, you open up his scripture, he will breathe life into you and you can engage in dialogue and conversation with God because that's where he does it. That's the purpose of this whole series. And so because he bends down to listen, 
I will pray as long as I have breath. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. And then how many of you feel like this? Death wraps its ropes around my neck. I can tell you right now that there have been many, many times where I have felt the rope of death around my neck. And the truth is, how many times have I tried to reach up and pull those ropes from around my neck? And I can't do it. I can't do it under my own power. I can't do it under my own strength. But only by his power and strength will those ropes come untied from around my neck. And we get to that place where we say, man, I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, please save me. Save me. How kind the Lord is. How good he is. So merciful, this God of ours. The Lord protects those of childlike faith. I was facing death. Listen, listen. I was facing death. I was facing death. And what did God do? What does the scripture say? You say it with me. And he saved me. You know what? We're going to move into a time now of communion. And we're going to do this intentionally because one of the things that, that we value is that understanding of God's mercy. And the symbol of God's mercy that he showed for us was, was coming and, and, you know, the scripture says that he bowed down. He bowed down and he listens to me. I mean, that's amazing for us to realize that we have a God who desires to be with us so much that he bows and he listens to us. He turns his ear to to us to hear our cries, to hear, Lord, save me, to hear, Lord, I praise you, to hear, Lord, Lord, this is where I'm at. Can you step in and help me? And so as, our, as we move into a time of communion, I, I, I just want to kind of coach maybe the parents a little bit. This morning is Family First Sunday, so we have our children with us. And, and mom and dad, if, if you have um, a child who you know has accepted Christ as their Savior and they, and they have done that, um, then you can feel confident that to have them participate in communion with you. Families, use this as an opportunity to explain the elements. You'll hear, me, you'll hear me talk about it, but you, you know, huddle together as a family and share this moment together. This is important. And, uh, and children, if, you're not at that, if they're not at that place, then it's okay to say, let's hold off, okay? Let's wait. I want you to watch mom and dad or mom or dad or maybe grandma or grandpa take and receive communion so that you'll understand better what it means when you come to that time in your life. So these are really important moments in the life of the church, amen? And so as we go now, let's prepare our hearts and remember the mercy that he shows us each day.